Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, may we invite you back to your seat. Before we begin, may we request that all mobile phones and beeping devices be switched off or turned to the silent mode. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Jeffrey Sachs. <laughs> Members of the foreign diplomatic community, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening to all. Welcome to the Singapore Management University and to the fourth Presidential Distinguished Lecture Series for 2017. Thank you for joining us today and of course, a very warm welcome to our speaker. Professor Jeffrey Sachs is a world-renowned professor of economics, a leader in sustainable development and a senior United Nations advisor. He is currently the university professor of Columbia University. So thank you. Professor Sachs for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us here today. I would now like to invite Professor Arnold de Meyer, President of Singapore Management University, up on stage to introduce our speaker. Professor de Meyer, please. Um, Professor Jeffrey Sachs, um, members of the Diplomatic Corps, ladies and gentlemen, students, colleagues, and members of the SMU community. A good afternoon and uh, a warm welcome to the, uh, this event of the SMU Presidential Distinguished Lecture Series in this academic year. You just said it was the fourth, and in my, in my text it says it's the third, so we actually will have to coordinate a bit better, I have to think. Um, also from my side, I uh, would like to uh, join, ask you to join me in welcoming Professor Jeffrey Sachs, who, uh, in a recent survey by The Economist newspaper, was ranked as among the world's three most influential living economists of the past decade. Uh, that sounds great, but if they say from the past decade, I actually probably would prefer to be currently the most uh, influential living economist. So that's what I will going to make you in, here at this stage. In addition to being a very well-known professor of economics, he is a leader in sustainable development, a senior UN advisor, a best-selling author, and a syndicated columnist whose monthly newspaper columns appear in more than 100 countries. Professor Sachs served as the director of the Earth Institute from 2002 to 2016, and he was appointed university professor at Columbia University in 2016. He also serves as the Ketele Professor of Sustainable Development and Professor of Health Policy and Management at Columbia University. And what I find also very important for tonight's discussion, perhaps, is that he is a special advisor to the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres on the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, something that is close to my uh, own uh, interests and my own heart. And previously advised both uh, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon on the Sustainable Development Goals and the Millennium Development Goals, and UN Secretary General Kofi Annan on the Millennium Development Goals. Um, he has a very extensive list of other uh, activities, and I'm not going to go into the details of that. You find them in the, uh, the little brochure that you received in uh, the beginning or when you came here um, uh, and entered this, this, this room. Uh, I should, however, men however, mention that he has received more than 20 honorary degrees and many awards and honors around the world. And he is a very frequent contributor to publications such as the Financial Times, the International Herald Tribune, and, and many other magazines and, and, and uh, titles and, and, and newspapers. Um, the title of the lecture today, this afternoon, is Charting Asia's Transformation to Sustainable Development. Many of you will be aware that one of SMU's selected research areas of excellence is indeed urban management and sustainability. It's one of the areas where we try to rally our faculty around and hope that we can contribute uh, and have impact on society uh, in, in terms of uh, through our research and through our uh, education. Because we know that as cities grow and flourish, they face increasingly complex challenges. Our researchers are here at the university are collaborating across disciplines to understand and solve these challenges. And the results are hopefully evident in the form of practical solutions to last mile problems, waste management, as well as the distillation of useful insights from large geospatial data sets. By working together with governments, businesses, and individuals on urban management and sustainability issues, SMU researchers are building cities that can withstand the test of time. I may remember you that uh, uh, about a year ago, we had uh, the then 
UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon addressed the SMU community on UN's sustainably, sustainable development goals. Uh, you may also remember that we have a tri-sector forum in May titled Partnerships for Sustainable Development, where we showcased how innovative cross-sector partnerships can uh, address emerging global challenges, those that individual nations face but are also shared across the globe. Um, we all recognize, and Professor Sachs uh, has made that point several times, that Asia is, the center of the, is at the center of the world economy with more than half the world's population and contributing roughly half of the global production. But we also here in Asia face at least half of the world's deep environmental ch challenges and crises. Therefore, Asia's successful transformation to sustainable development is vital, not only for the future of the region, but for the world as a whole. Um, I look forward uh, to the points that Professor Sachs will bring about the challenges, I guess, on Asia's, uh, or Asia's major challenges regarding the conservation of biodiversity, transition to low carbon energy, upscaling of quality education, reducing inequalities, and uh, the impact of technological innovation. Um, I look forward to uh, his insights on how the framework of um, the uh, UN's sustainable development goals can be used uh, to deploy solutions at local, national, and regional levels. And that, since we are at Singapore Management University, as well by business as by civil society. I thank you for coming uh, here to this afternoon. I look personally forward to an enlightening lecture and an evening of discussion, and I would like you uh, to join me in welcoming Professor Sachs to the stage. President, and ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the very warm welcome and uh, also for uh, describing the importance of the topic. So I too look forward to a discussion. We need uh, you and we need uh, SMU and we need Singapore to help solve some very complicated and very time sensitive problems. I'm mostly going to talk about problems today. Uh, the world is filled with problems. Uh, even though uh, I think Singapore has relatively fewer of the problems uh, uh, than uh, most of the rest of the world, that's because you've solved a lot of problems and the challenge of sustainable development is really a problem solving uh, crisis for the world. It's a hard set of challenges. And it's a hard set of challenges, uh, mainly because we have a scale problem here, uh, which is not to solve the problem of one place or a particular country or uh, eventually to get somewhere, but we have problems of urgency that require global action or, let's say, local action everywhere. And that is not easy to achieve in this world. Uh, we are not good at cooperation in general. Uh, we're not good at actions that run against short-term political and economic interests, even if they are manifestly in uh, the real interests of society and certainly in the long-term interests. And so the challenges that uh, come under the rubric of sustainable development don't fit easily in national politics. They don't fit easily in the time frame that we're used to dealing with. And yet the urgency is there whether we like it or not. Issues like global warming. The climate system doesn't really care what we think if we continue to put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, we will wreck the climate and we will wreck our well-being, uh, whether or not we ever get around to dealing with it. And we have several challenges like that that are time-bound, very important, require uh, deep transformations, and require a change of direction. So that's really my theme in my remarks. 
I will speak for roughly a half an hour or so to set the stage, but then I count on you to come in with uh, good debate and comment and questions. I do want to emphasize two big points from the start. Two, uh, okay, almost a contradiction. First, this is beyond an academic issue. So I'm not here to talk about uh, what we sometimes debate in academia. Uh, this is real and it's urgent. And then the direct contrary is this is utterly an academic challenge because it will not be solved without universities taking a major role. The issues, okay, maybe I won't say it for the government here, but for most governments in the world, far too complicated for the governments to solve on their own without a significant input of academic expertise. And so one of the challenges is an organizational challenge, and I'd like you to think about that and also comment on that. How can we get the world's universities actively engaged in the problem solving in a useful way? Because I find that to be one of the most important aspects of this uh, issue. These are the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, I'm happy to hear that uh, former Secretary General Ban Ki-moon was here to talk about them. Uh, he brought them to fruition. It was during his mandate that these were negotiated. Is this, is this on or is this just for the recording maybe? Should be on. Nope. Yes. Is it? Yes, it's on. Oh, okay. Good. Thank you. I just want to step away from the, from the podium. So these were uh, goals that were negotiated over a three-year period from 2012 to 2015. And they play a very important role or they might play a very important role. I say they play a very important role because they are the only globally agreed goals that we have in our generation around the topics of sustainable development and around some very, very key challenges. They are notable in that they are universally agreed in fact, in a period of about six weeks, two major universal agreements were reached. These goals in September of 2015, and then a few weeks later, the Paris Climate Agreement. And that was a notable moment of global uh, consensus. Then we got Donald Trump, we got Brexit, we got lots of other developments. There goes the global consensus. We seemingly can't agree on anything right now, uh, but crucially, uh, this was a very uh, laborious and serious process to reach a common understanding of a common set of challenges. And maybe it's worth saying just a word about how this process developed, because that by itself is interesting. It developed starting in 2012 when the UN member states came together on the 20th anniversary of the Rio Earth Summit, which was 1992. The Rio Earth Summit was a glorious occasion. It was actually the first time the world agreed on the concept of sustainable development. And at the time, the governments agreed on three major treaties on climate change, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, on combating desertification in the UN Convention to Combat Desertification, and on protecting biodiversity. That was 1992. That was a high water mark of global cooperation and the high water mark of environmentalism. And the world's leaders left that meeting having made a historic contribution or so it seemed. <clears throat> and we had a Republican president then, uh, President uh, George H.W. Bush Sr., 
who signed three environmental treaties, which is almost unimaginable in American politics today. So it seemed a consensus had been reached and a framework had been reached. And then, as you know, on climate, despite negotiating the Kyoto Protocol in 1997, the U.S. didn't sign. The issue remained fractious. Largely, my country has been a major fracture point for this whole period. But the debate of whether the U.S. would do something if China didn't do it and many other issues came to center stage. The U.S. Uh, Senate actually did not ratify the Convention on Biological Diversity because our very foolish right-wing politicians said that people who own private property have the right to destroy species on them. Who can tell property owners what to do? And we will not be bound by the United Nations. So we never even ratified the Convention on Biological Diversity. And the Convention on Combating Desertification, who here has ever heard of it? Anybody? My point. Okay, these are insignificant countries that are facing this problem. Countries like Iran, Iraq, Syria, Somalia, Mali, and they don't bother anybody. But the idea of desertification being important, well, again, not to the generals, not to the congressmen, not to the senators uh, in my country, and apparently not to almost anybody. And so really another very important treaty, because what that treaty involves is really the dryland parts of the world. You're not part of that. But if you are in the drylands, life's tough because it's very hard to grow food, it's very hard to remain out of famine, and it's very hard to remain out of trouble. And so combating the spread of degraded land, which is what that treaty is about, should be a high priority. But nobody here has even heard of it. And I work every day in the UN, and I never hear about it either. So 20 years later, the governments got together, and there was a story in Nature magazine, the wonderful weekly science magazine, uh, about the report card of the three Rio treaties. And it always st struck, uh, stuck with me that article because it started with three F's that these all three treaties had failed miserably. Uh, the climate convention had not stopped the rise of greenhouse gases. Uh, the convention on biological diversity had achieved nothing, I think it's fair to say. And the convention on combating desertification, what's that? And so there was no implementation. And that was really the backdrop of the 2012 anniversary. Not much of a happy anniversary. It was really a rather depressing and glum and alarming meeting. And it was in that context that one government, the government of Colombia, recommended we need to bring these objectives more to the public awareness globally because having them remain in the body of treaties and having them be the uh, ambit of diplomats and lawyers and international law is not doing the trick. And so the proposal was made at the Rio plus 20, as it was called, to negotiate a framework of sustainable development, including sustainable development goals. Interestingly, governments warmed up to the process, and they got heavily involved. And there was a three-year process of trying to set a framework. And that framework was actually agreed in the summer of 2015 
under the name Agenda 2030. In, well, I don't know if it's an important document. We will determine whether it's an important document. But it's important now because it's the only such agreement we are ever going to get this generation. Because they're hard to get, they're hard to come by, and when you get them, either they become real or the opportunity is utterly lost. And we can't afford to lose another 20 years. We can't even afford to have lost the first 20 years because the world's become already tremendously dangerous as a result of our lost time. In fact, there's an article in The Lancet this week uh, that is worth reading about the health consequences of the ongoing global warming and associated climate change that are already with us. So the tense that we face future problems is all wrong now because we're really in the midst, obviously, of the crisis given how long we've procrastinated on this. So that's why I think these goals are important and I spend pretty much every day, morning till night, trying to rally some attention, focus, and solutions to these goals. So why is it so important to have these 17 goals that go from fighting poverty in SDG 1 to fighting global warming in SDG 13, reducing inequalities, SDG 10, sustainable cities, SDG 11, and so forth. And the reason is the world economy does not take care of itself. And the direction and nature of global change, though very positive in many ways, if you look at economic growth, not bad, by the way. So if you are focused on gross world product per capita, you could say, what's the problem, Mr. Sachs? The world economy grows 3 to 4% per year, even when there's a horrendous crisis as there was in 2008, there's a recovery afterwards. And we've reached quite a large global economy. We have now a world output per year estimated to be about $125 trillion for the 7.5 billion people on the planet. That's an average income of about $17,000 per person measured at international prices. And that's not bad for our humble world, which started out impoverished. And now this country's absolutely rich, and the neighborhood is solidly middle income, and there's disappearing extreme poverty in most of Asia. There are pockets of extreme poverty, but very little. And so you would say, not bad. And indeed, most of my colleagues in economics departments say not bad. And that's why I left an economics department 20 years ago. <laughs> because they don't get it in the mainstream economics departments. Because there are two things that really are quite bad. One is that our economic system does absolutely have a tendency towards expanded inequality. And we're seeing it in many parts of the world, rising inequality. In the United States, it's been dramatic. And it gets to weird dimensions that those left behind vote for a billionaire reality TV guy who knows nothing except appointing billionaires to his cabinet so that they can cut taxes to make more billions. So it's a little bit bizarre, but uh, the fact of Mr. Trump's election really is a result of inequality that he's working overtime to try to increase, because he's not a nice man. Uh, you'll welcome him in Asia, you're welcome to keep him. Uh, <laughs> 
Heracles. I know, that's not fair to Asia, but Asia's a big place. He could go lots of places for the next few years and come back at the end of his term. And we would have, this might be a good solution. Let's brainstorm on that. Um, so this is one problem, which is that the inequality is widening and actually rather dramatically in part because of underlying technological changes now, which absolutely favor machines and people who own those machines or own the systems. So it's nice to be the owner of Google or Apple or Amazon or Facebook or Microsoft. They topped out at a market cap of $3.2 trillion as of yesterday morning. That's unbelievable that those five companies are ranked one, two, three, four, five in global world cap, despite having small labor forces and very few physical assets. And little companies like Exxon are pushed down to number 10 on the list and General Motors farther down. And this is the new world, but it's very concentrated wealth. And the second factor is that politics in most places is not very uh, well organized to counteract these uh, market forces. In fact, these days, I would say most politics is leaning with the wind, not against the wind, uh, and amplifying the inequalities of income. So this is one reason why the sustainable development goals are important and why there was actually a goal put in over the objection of the United States for a while and then uh, it was conceded goal number 10 to reduce inequalities of income because we need to and because the underlying pace is not just high inequality but widening inequalities of income. And the second reason is the environmental crises. And these crises are pervasive and they are dangerous and they are in front of us every day. And they're very serious and they're very difficult to deal with. And there are multiple environmental crises, not just uh, uh, global warming, though that is no doubt the most significant of them, but we have massive pollutants. Uh, the oceans are not only warming, they're also acidifying, they're also increasingly polluted with microplastics and other uh, toxics and pollutants. We are destroying habitat around the world. Uh, that is directly driving species to extinction in this neighborhood, of course. Uh, if we close our eyes, all of Sumatra, uh, all of uh, Borneo would be clear cut for palm oil and probably quite profitably, uh, but not socially profitably, socially disastrously. And this kind of environmental damage is around the world and very deep. And it basically reflects the fact that the planet was not well designed for seven and a half billion human beings that uh, each are uh, consuming $17,000 of output and the resources uh, that that entails. Uh, indeed, when uh, Robert, uh, Thomas Robert Malthus wrote principles of population, warming about the population, risks uh, and uh, the carrying capacity of, uh, of Earth, though not in exactly those terms, that was 1798. And the population was about 850 million people. And so we've had an order of magnitude increase in population and we've had at least an order of magnitude increase in resource use. Uh, of course, the whole fossil fuel age came. And the reasons for that resource use are very powerful and very deeply entrained. 
And by that I mean changing those resource patterns is not a simple matter. So we are in the grips of climate change that is now proceeding extremely rapidly. We face a possibility of a runaway global warming, and we have hints of it now because the most recent data, again, just out this week, show that the CO2 concentration jumped last year by the highest increment that it has ever increased in the instrument record by 3.3 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere, from 400 parts per million to 403.3 parts per million between 2015 and 2016. Why that very large increment? Because the natural sinks of land and ocean did not take up as much CO2 as is normally the case, but probably released net CO2 into the atmosphere. And we know that because in El Nino years, which are often very dry for certain rainforests, those rainforests go from being sinks of CO2 to being, er, to being sources of CO2. In other words, if you measure the CO2 flux at the top of the Amazon, instead of the CO2 being absorbed, it's being released into the atmosphere. And the possibility is that this becomes a, an ongoing positive feedback if we reach tipping points that nobody knows for sure. But what the climatologists do know for sure is that the underlying climate system is unstable, nonlinear, and subject to positive feedbacks. But the timestamp of them and the uh, dimensions of them cannot be read with precision from the paleoclimate record, so you have to make inferences, and the inferences are we're close to tremendous crisis. Not to mention the fact that we're already in climate derangement. The several hurricanes that hit us in the Caribbean uh, last month, our testimony to that, we had one high intensity hurricane, we call them category five, after another in the Atlantic. We actually had a hurricane hit Ireland two weeks ago. That's the first time that we, it wasn't called a hurricane afterwards because it was extra tropical. But for Ireland to be hit that way, nobody had seen hurricane tracks like that before. And so there's a lot of energetics in the Atlantic Basin and in the Pacific Basin that we haven't seen the dynamics before. So the point of sustainable development is the market does not self-govern if we needed to know this. And the world market economy is not self-governing. And our political systems are not functioning very well. It is probably the case that if the world ran like Singapore, then there wouldn't be a problem. Because the problem would be studied, it would be addressed, and we would be on our way. And so that's why what you do is really quite important. Uh, and uh, I believe quite literally that Singapore has a huge role to play in this region, which is, after all, as uh, the president said, uh, half of the world, half of the world's economy, currently estimated to be about 45% of the world's economy uh, in flow of output. It's become half of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, it is 60% uh, of the world's population, and it's under tremendous environmental stress right in your neighborhood, everywhere. And so this is why we need to take these goals. So what does it mean to achieve sustainable development? What does it require? Three ideas are the pillars of sustainable development. The three pillars are economic prosperity, check that off for 
Singapore. Economic inclusion, and I'd give kind of half a grade or maybe three quarters because economic inclusion means living in diversity, which this country does extremely well, remarkably well, but it also means keeping economic inequalities, both wealth and income, limited. And while it's a little hard to say what's happening in the inequality in this country, it's fairly high. And in many countries, China, the United States, many countries of Europe, it has widened considerably over the last 20 years. In my country, we are losing the middle class. And by the way, we're losing it in a very identifiable way, which is that if you have a college degree, you're in pretty good shape to make it. Not guaranteed, but pretty good shape. If you don't have a college degree, either you're a gazillionaire because you dropped out for a startup. There are a few of those. And then for all of the rest of those without a college degree, life is really difficult because the jobs are disappearing. The jobs are being replaced by smart machines that are making a lot of money, thank you, a lot of money for those who own them and control the big data, but not for people who are uh, clerks uh, or shop owners which are disappearing and certainly not for the goods producing sectors, which are basically being fully automated. We now have, you don't have agriculture here, but uh, we have a big agriculture sector in the United States, but it employs less, far less than 1% of the uh, labor force to produce all the food for the US plus a lot of net exports, and that's because the tractors do the job. And you don't even have to be in a track, you don't even have to have a driver in a tractor right now. Uh, one of my favorite conversations recently was with a farmer who told me that he still likes to sit on the tractor. The tractor drives itself, it decides where to put the fertilizer, it's all, uh, it's all precision agriculture. But he said he sits backward looking at where it's gone and he reads a book along the way, but it's very nice. Uh, life, but that's what farming is. We will not have miners anymore. Hopefully we won't have coal mines anymore, but we will have some other mines, and those will be fully automated. And increasingly, that's what assembly operations uh, in manufacturing are. They are being run by smart machines and with very few production workers left. And so, the inequalities are stark and need to, be, uh, need to be faced. So what are the challenges of uh, being able to address these problems? I would say briefly, in order to achieve fair economy and in order to achieve an environmentally safe economy, prosperous, inclusive, environmentally safe, the three famous pillars, economic, social, and environmental, societies need a rather deep transformation. Most of them have some of these transformations underway. Very few have all of them. Even Singapore does not score well on some environmental considerations. Why? because you're still fossil fuel dependent. And it's true that Singapore doesn't have such easy alternatives, but that means that fossil fuels still fuel the economy, both the electric grid and, of course, uh, the automobile transport. And Singapore also imports a lot of goods which are embodied CO2 emissions. So if you don't produce it here, you buy it from China. China emits for us, thank you. Uh, but uh, it still is an embodied emission. Uh, and so the trans transformation is not simple. So I think that there are 
something like six transitions that are partly underway and in some places need to be encouraged. The demographic transition, the most important one, is we have to stabilize the world population. That's not a problem for here. Uh, I know uh, there's a lot of concern population's going to decline because the fertility rate isn't even at replacement rate. Not so bad. <laughs> there nothing, there's nothing in the logic of the world that says the population should continue to grow or that it was really important to have seven and a half billion people and we should really try to get 10 billion people crowded into the planet. We're on a trajectory towards 11 billion people by the end of the century. Most of the increase in Africa. So Africa is on a trajectory because of high fertility rates to reach 4 billion Africans by 2100 according to the medium scenario of the UN Population Division. Pretty frightening in my view because it would be a disaster for Africa because they can't produce the food, especially in a warming climate. It's a dryland part of the world. There would be really very serious problems unless there is a demographic transition. Of course, there are other aspects to the demographic transition, two others that are notable. Uh, one that uh, you epitomize, the whole world is moving to uh, urban uh, life and urban settlements. And that's basically because I believe there won't be very many farmers in the world uh, in 50 years. There will still be a lot of farming and uh, the robots will do it and they will bring the food to us, uh, but we will not have farmers. It's all being mechanized and uh, rural life is farming life. And without uh, farmers, uh, people live in cities uh, because all the other occupations uh, other than mining and, uh, and uh, the commodity-based uh, uh, or the extractive-based uh, occupations are urban by nature. And so mass urbanization is a second phenomenon. The world right now is 54% urban. We reached the halfway point of urbanization around 2007. We'll reach two-thirds urban by around 2030 and probably 70% urban world population by 2050. Singapore's got a lot of practice in this. You should advise everyone else how to have sustainable cities. Really important. And the other demographic transition, which is pretty much inevitable unless we play the ultimate Ponzi scheme of population, is aging. Because it's natural as population, growth slows down as fertility rates uh, fall to replacement or below. And as longevity increases, the population will age. And Asia will reach uh, Asia's uh, median age right now for all of Asia is, uh, I think, around 28 years, but it will reach around 40 years uh, median age by mid-century and around 50 years median age by the end of uh, the century. Quite different societies. Uh, a silver lining, well, I like aging more and more every year. Uh, it uh, kind of dawned on me what an important process this was. I didn't appreciate it uh, at some point in my career. Now uh, I certainly uh, appreciate the wisdom of aging, um, the inevitability of it, one could say. Maybe there's a silver lining. Uh, you'd like to think that older people won't fight so many wars as younger people, but then you realize you get septuagenarians like Trump who seems to have no problem sending young people to war, but if there aren't so many of them, but the problem is they're gonna send drones to war and uh, robots, so we're not gonna get out of war simply by the demographic transition, though maybe, maybe there'll be a, a slightly reduced tendency to it. The second transition is the 
economic transition. I call it the techno-economic transition because as, again, as Singapore knows full well, the essence of economic prosperity is raising technological capacity. It is the, it's not the capital accumulation per se, it's the accumulation of know-how and capital that embodies more sophisticated technologies. And in a sense, this is, uh, of course, really the ace in the hole for global development right now. The information revolution that continues is a wonderful, wonderful advance of technology, at least of potential for development, because it has a lot of very deeply right features for addressing development issues. One is that it can reach the whole world. We've never had a diffusion of technology like the information and mobility uh, diffusion that we've had in the last 30 years. We went from no cell phones to seven and a half billion subscriptions. It's been the most rapid diffusion of a core technology in human history. It can reach remote places. It can come at very low cost and it's tremendously empowering. It's one of the most important general purpose technologies, basically the digital uh, revolution. It certainly rivals the steam engine and electrification in significance, and it can potentially be clean, and very clean and very green as long as the electricity uh, that uh, moves the electrons uh, is produced in a low carbon way, we're in good shape. Uh, and so the Techno-economic revolution is one of the most heartening uh, parts of the transition to sustainable development. It could really fuel a massive leapfrogging of the poorest countries in the world that have been isolated, that have not had access to information, that have not been able to uh, develop for uh, basically uh, geographical reasons uh, as, as well as other reasons. The social transition, again, it's uh, in Singapore's uh, strong view is with a world population of seven and a half billion, with an information revolution, with connectivity, we are in a migration uh, dynamic right now that is absolutely dramatic. We are in each other's faces more than ever, and it's leading to political backlash everywhere. That's the other point that got Mr. Trump elected, which is that he said a lot of nasty things about a lot of foreigners. And that was, that's a very good way to win elections these days. And so uh, the social transformation that is needed, that comes, I think, it comes with urban life, which is that you live in diverse communities uh, when Sonia and I walk in New York, we find it interesting when we overhear someone speaking English uh, because it's so much diversity that uh, you hear every language uh, but, but English, and it's quite wonderful. And New York is, uh, um, I say it on a day of a terrorist attack, uh, New York is an incredibly polyglot, uh, and uh, welcoming and open community. And urban life, I think, tends to produce this. But the backlash comes in the rural areas, and that's where, again, Trump's vote came, for example, or in the suburban, lower density areas where people go because they don't want to be bothered. And certainly not by somebody who speaks some strange language. And uh, interestingly, in, uh, in focus groups, uh, language shows up in the United States as one of the real triggers. Uh, people in the Midwest who are anti-immigrant say about the Hispanic migration, they don't like us, they don't even try to speak English properly. And so this question of social I put it as social transition. Either we learn to live with each other uh, 
in an age of high mobility that is inevitable, or we're going to fracture and have this remarkable uh, experience of this resurgence of right-wing nationalism that is clearly evident everywhere. Uh, and no, almost no country, almost no country handles diversity very well. Singapore seems to, uh, at least from my impression. Canada seems to very well. Switzerland seems to because they live in their individual cantons and uh, nobody bothers uh, anybody else and everybody's rich, so it's not a problem. Uh, and uh, not too many other places are really great at uh, ethnic diversity, but I would say that it is another one of the key transitions. Three more that are crucial. The energy transition. We have to do something crazy, but absolutely have to do it. And I don't know how it's going to be done. Nobody does. But it's very serious and quite urgent. And that is, of course, the transition out of fossil fuels into zero carbon energy in a period of 30 years global scale. Even saying it sounds batty. Why? Well, fossil fuels grew up over the last two centuries. It's been about 250 years since uh, 200, yeah, close to 240 years since James Watt uh, made a commercial steam engine and coal became the uh, primary energy source of choice for industrialization. And we developed a world economy, very sophisticated, very rich, on steam, internal combustion engine, gas turbines. And so we use fossil fuels for about 80 to 85 percent of the world's primary energy. And the fossil fuel use, of course, is the main driver of global warming. We're emitting right now from energy nearly 40 billion tons of carbon dioxide per year, which has been enough until recently to raise the CO2 concentration by two to two and a half parts per million. And then, as I mentioned, it jumped 3.3 parts per million this past year. Well, the climate scientists tell us how the cumulative carbon emissions translates into temperature change. And in Paris, in the Paris Climate Agreement, the world agreed to a standard, not precisely defined, but the standard is to keep global warming to be well below 2 degrees Celsius. And what that means is, compared to the pre-industrial Earth temperature, that the warming from greenhouse gas emissions should be enough to stop at 1.7 or 1.8 degrees C. But we've already had an increase of 1.1 degrees Celsius till now. We're on a trajectory of continued warming because the energy imbalance of the current greenhouse concentrations would warm the planet even if emissions stopped in totally, would continue to warm the planet by another 0.3 degrees C, for example, roughly speaking. So we already have cooked in maybe about 1.4 degrees Celsius increase world average less at the equator, more in the high latitudes because of various amplification effects. So in northern climates, already there's been a two to two and a half degree Celsius rise, which is why the ice sheets are in such peril, because the warming both of the land and the oceans is amplified in high latitudes and poleward direction. How do we stop? This. Well, first, why do we care about that threshold of well below two degrees? The answer is 
twofold. One is that that level of warming is enough to derange the climate system that we have experienced throughout all of human civilization. We're already entering a climate that Earth has not had during the whole history of our species. And in fact, the carbon dioxide concentration now is estimated to be above anything Earth has seen for the last 800,000 years. So we're moving rapidly into a dangerous unknown. We're also moving to those tipping points. One of the tipping points could be the destruction of a lot of the ice sheets, both of West Antarctica and Greenland. And there are reasons to believe, because of the paleoclimate record, that just a little bit increase of temperature from where we are now is enough to set in motion the loss of these ice sheets, or a substantial part of them, the evidence being that when Earth was maybe 1.5 degrees C above the pre-industrial, that was the previous interglacial period in Earth's history, about 130,000 years ago. The sea level was eight meters higher than today. So what the climatologists are saying is stop. Don't try that. Don't try three degrees, four degrees C. Stop below two degrees C. But what do the climate models tell us? that to stop below two degrees C, we have to stop the cumulative emission of CO2 going forward to less than 800 billion tons of CO2 remaining emission. In other words, you can't emit cumulatively 800 billion tons and still have a good chance of staying below even two degrees. But what is 800 billion tons of CO2 20 years at the current rate of energy use? We're in trouble. 20 years left at the current rate, not to mention a growing world economy, puts us past what we just agreed in Paris to accomplish. So to stay below two degrees, in fact, to stay well below two degrees, we have to decarbonize the energy system. And the usual estimate, which I will say in shorthand, is we have to get out of carbon by mid-century. Roughly 30 years left. That is a massive transformation. And you don't exactly see our political leaders running to the cause, even though they've signed the agreement. Partly because they signed an agreement to do something without understanding what it would take to do it. Because they didn't sign the means to do it, they signed the target. And then, as I keep pointing out, then we got Donald Trump. And he's a very interesting case for you to understand also. What drives his announcement to get out of Paris? Because remember, one of the big things he said was, uh, we're going to pull out of the Paris Climate Agreement. The answer is not his constituents who are marching to get out of the climate agreement. Nothing like it. The answer is the billionaires that surround him that own pipelines, oil refineries, natural gas companies, and so on. It's corruption, pure and simple. Except in the U.S. it's not simple because it's legal corruption. We call it campaign contributions. Unbelievable. And the Supreme Court, which has been really weird, made it not only legal but said you can't even stop it because that would be a denial of the freedom of speech of ExxonMobil. 
And if we could put ExxonMobil in jail, then I'd give them freedom of speech too. But since corporations do not have any means of self-responsibility or necessary accountability, the idea that they have the same freedom of speech as I do, I don't find very comforting, actually. So in a nutshell, we face two profound challenges on the energy transition. One is the technical challenge of moving a deep part of our global infrastructure to wind, solar, geothermal, hydroelectric, biomass, nuclear, in a rapid, safe, timely way without a big stumble of the world economy. It's not a problem you would like to take on if it weren't for the grim realities of the alternative. And the second is we face vested interests that are tremendously powerful. Because in the 20th century, the most powerful industry by far was the oil industry. Because it was in alliance with the military and it was in alliance with transport. Not all transport, with automotive transport. And so it was the core of our politics. We kept electing presidents from Texas, not by coincidence. That's where the power was. That's where the money was. Most importantly, that's where the oil was. That's how we got the Bushes. That's how we got Lyndon Johnson. That's how we have Donald Trump, even though he's not from there. He's from some other planet. Um, <laughs> but we have this power, but it's unbelievably untimely. So Singapore has not accomplished that transformation. It hasn't even made a plan, as far as I can see, for that transformation. There's not enough sunshine on your rainy days to uh, make it easy to do this. You don't have a lot of wind. Uh, it's, uh, it's a big, and you don't have hydropower. Uh, the mountains are not quite enough to uh, power uh, the Singapore economy. So this is a real challenge. But it's a worldwide challenge to solve that problem. Very quickly, the ecological and the governance challenge, and then I will stop and open it up for discussion. And I left 30 other slides. You can have a look. Uh, Self-explanatory. Uh, but I thought I would stop uh, at this point to uh, explain uh, just these transformations. The ecological transition is actually to address the problem that Malthus talked about in 1798 and that economists have laughed at him about for the next 220 years. And that is the ability to grow enough food for the population. And at a certain level, we certainly grow enough calories right now to feed the planet. That's not the problem. But the problem is that our agriculture system is not environmentally sustainable. It is itself the number one driver of species destruction, habitat loss, pollutants, greenhouse gas emissions, water depletion, the way we produce food is not sustainable. And it's worse than that because climate change is undermining the food system we have because there's more instability, thermal stress, droughts, floods, and therefore an instability of the food system. Then add the fact that we're going to have more people on the planet. We don't know whether it'll be another 1 billion because we succeed in the demographic transition or 4 billion because we don't. But that food challenge, agriculture challenge, is phenomenal. And what I mean by the ecological transition is sustainable land use, that the food is grown in a sustainable manner. Water, soils, habitat, non-pollutants, non-greenhouse gas emissions. It's a mess. And it's as hard as the energy transition because there isn't one agricultural system. There are a thousand of them that need change around the world. And 
there's not enough science around for this yet. And there's not enough interest because the big food growers don't care. They care about growing food. They're not thinking enough about the underlying ecological consequences. And the R&D on this has been woefully limited. And the final point is the governance tr transition. What do I mean by that? I mean a couple of things. One is truly more countries govern like Singapore. And I mean that seriously. Looking ahead, strategizing, understanding what the deep challenges are, mobilizing the best minds, and taking serious forward-looking investment actions to realize the solutions. We are in an age where we need planning. My country, we don't plan. The word is even a dirty word. It was supposed to be expunged. The World Bank was supposed to close down all the world's planning ministries in the 1980s and 1990s. Mercifully, this region said, no, we'll continue to plan. But how to get governments to look ahead on a time horizon of 10, 20, 30 years is a phenomenally big challenge. How to get them to be serious. I just can't help but tell you US stories. But we are going to vote, supposedly, on a massive tax reform where they haven't even finished the bill. And then they want to vote on it in a few days. Why? Because they're crooks, by the way. Seriously. Because they just want to pass a tax cut. But they can't bear to even study the problem. They can't bear to have an honest discussion, honest hearings, a report, serious reflection. Because obviously, if you had that, it would undo all of their intention to grab uh, about $5 trillion of resources in tax cuts. But this is the opposite of planning right now. That's one problem. The other problem on governance that I want to mention is regional cooperation. Absolutely central. Because none of these solutions can work without a regional focus. Renewable energy is not local, it's regional. In some place the wind's blowing, in other place the sun is shining, in another place there's a mountain for hydropower or for pumped hydro for storage. You bring the pieces together for the solution. We don't have regional cooperation in general. For deep reasons, we have regional fissures. We have dividing lines because neighbors don't trust each other. They've been invading each other for centuries. And so there are inherent difficulties of cooperation, plus geopolitics. Because whenever there is a local tension, one side chooses the US, the next side chooses Russia, another side chooses China, and then it becomes geopolitics. And we have grown up for the last 50 years to say, OK, China and its allies are on one side. The US, that's Japan and South Korea. And every part of the world is divided like this. Pakistan and India. The Middle East, of course. Why are there these horrendous wars in Syria? Almost nothing to do with Syria, by the way, except that Russia supports this one, Iran supports this one, so the US and Saudi Arabia have to be on the other side, and soon enough you have a war. And the war is a proxy war for the big powers. Well, this system will not work for sustainable development. We need regional cooperation. We need China, Japan, Korea, and ASEAN to be on the same side. 
which is the side of Asia, not to be divided between great powers in some big balance of power tension because it will not work. Or the idea that we're going to have a TPP, but China's going to be out because we're going to write the rules. This is worse than kindergarten. Honestly. Because at least in kindergarten, the teacher comes over and says, don't do that. Share the sandbox. But we have presidents saying these things. And I won't preach any more, <laughs> except to say that all of these issues require a very deep agreement on direction, on common steps, on shared technological development, and on infrastructure that is at a regional scale. China's One Belt, One Road, for example, wonderful. Exactly what the world needs as long as it is a low carbon One Belt, One Road. Building One Belt, One Road to transmit coal and oil and gas is not what the world needs. But what the world does need is an integrated structure of a shared infrastructure that links China, Southeast Asia, Central Asia, Western Asia, and Europe together. So it's a wonderful idea. If we could take the politics out and put the thinking, the knowledge, and the goodwill in, we will achieve sustainable development. Thank you very much.